Harry, thanks for your time uh, today. I, I know that it's a busy season, but with a few abandonments, you've, you've had a day off. How would you look um, and reflect on the start of, of the season so far for you? Yeah, um, delighted. I had plenty of winners. Um, obviously, it was a little bit slow until July. There was no racing, but when we got going, I tipped away through the summer. And, um, you know, as soon as the October horses came out, Paul, Paul Nichols' horses were flying. I had a great October. And I think in November, we had 24 winners. So, well, I did anyway. And, um, yeah, very happy with that. When you started this year, obviously, we know it's been a very strange 2020, but racing, thankfully, in the main, particularly the jump season has cracked on. Did you set out to be champion jockey this year? Was it your target to ride as many winners as you can? Yeah, I think sort of going into the first sort of Southern meeting, I was thinking, oh, if I just plug away this summer, I'd, I'll have a good chance. And um, if we get to get Cheltenham out of the way, then and if I'm within sort of arm's reach of whoever's in front of me, then we'll have a right good go at it. But um, look, it's, 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 been, it's been a great start. We've had plenty of winners. The horses are running well and um, hopefully long may it continue until the sort of end of the season. We had, um, we had Paul on the opening show a while back and he said that um, he'd had a £50 each way bet on you at 33 to 1 or something at the start of the year. So, so now, given the start that you have made and he has made, has your attitude changed whereby now you're saying to your agent, I want to go everywhere. I want to ride as many horses as I can. Um, to be honest, we, we, we've sort of had a chat and we said we're just going to try and stick to more quality rather than quantity and keep going that way at the moment. Just because if you go around riding anything and everything, and well, I suppose the, the risk of getting hurt is probably a lot more, isn't it? And, um, you know, at the end of the day, my sort of first port of call is to ride plenty of winners for Paul and ride plenty of big winners and good winners. So, um, I think it, as long as we stay going the way we're going, then I'll have a good chance. But, um, you know, I'm running up to Christmas, sort of, we'll get that out of the way. And then after that, I'm going to start riding out for a lot more people, going to a few yards, try and tip away and, you know, get a few extra half decent spares, hopefully. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, it's, it's what it's all about. I, I don't think you can do it. You, you don't think you can be champion jockey riding out for one sort of trainer. I know Paul's got an amazing string of horses, but it's the... It's the Mondays down at Plumptons and, 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 the, and the Tuesdays and places like that, I think, where you make the difference. You're, you're 22 now. Um, 16 years old was when you had your first ride. Um, do you have to sort of pinch yourself that you're in the position you're in so, so early on, relatively early on in your career? Well, I had quite a lot of luck early on. Um, you know, I suppose it started off even back in the pony racing days when I sort of had a few good racing ponies, rode plenty of pony race winners and then I went point to pointing straight away and um, I was leading novice rider the first season I was riding and I was working for Anthony and Rachel Honeyball um, so they were very good to me I learned a lot down there schooling wise and um, they were a great help and I sort of went to the sales and worked on the yard and it was just a great learning curve starting off there and then so I think I was there for seven months and then um, I went to um Paul's when I was Paul Nichols when I was still sixteen but um turned conditional and um and then I think I, that was my obviously my first season I had thirty five winners and got on really well. It seems from the the sounds of it, or for lots of people watching this as though it's kind of been incredibly smooth and successful from sixteen right the way through, which it certainly has on track. But when you were a younger boy there was a lot of hard graft that went into you being in the position you're in now. I know that Ron Hodges, who doesn't train too far from, from here where we are now, he was a massive help to you. But this is from the age of what, like 12, 13, uh, or so, maybe younger? Yeah, I mean, Ron Hodges actually bought half my first racing pony when I was nine. No way. Yeah, and I used to work down there in the summers and I was riding, At that out, age? I was riding out for him when I was nine years old. So uh, that he was obviously a huge part and... Um, I still speak to him like every day now, and um, you know he he's um, he's got a real sort of interest in my riding and watches everything. And That's uh, so sweet. yeah, no, he's, uh, he's he's been a massive part of my career, and um, obviously I wouldn't be where I am without them now. So it, so it goes without saying that for all that the success on track has been relatively immediate, it's taken a lot of like I mean, there's not many nine, ten year olds that are going in to muck out in Somerset. Or no. anywhere in the country, is there? No. Like, it's pretty unique. So you must have always known that yeah, being I, a jockey was I what suppose, you wanted. Um, I remember the first time I met Ron, I think I was like eight years old, and I met him outside. He was in a 
pub, in a restaurant or something, having some dinner with my grandparents or something like that. And my, me and my dad were, were across the road getting a takeaway. And uh, he came out and um, spoke to my dad. And uh, he saw me in the passenger seat. And my dad was telling him that I do a bit of hunting and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, you ride you? And he was, I was like, yeah. And um, so he said, oh, I'll, I'll come down tomorrow and see you ride, see what you ride like. So he came down the next day. And uh, I didn't think he'd turn up. And he did. and, and that was that and then we got a racing pony and all the rest was history really but pony racing was massive i think racing uk did a feature on you didn't they when you were pony racing Is that yeah right? and you were like a wee nipper then but it must have been such a good foundation for you do, do you find it that it's a good help massive help you know even you know riding with the racing boots on putting colors on back protector going to the start, race courses, it's a massive help and like, you know, point to points and, um, you know, I suppose it's, it's um, you, you half know what you're doing before you, you go to and ride in a point to point because you see what, what everyone else is doing and, and um, yeah, it was something that I enjoyed and I definitely learnt loads doing and um, it's, um, yeah, it was, it was just, a, I suppose, a stepping stone to becoming a professional jockey. And when you were a kid, did you have dreams of winning King George's Gold Cups, Grand Nationals. I, I dreamt of riding for the likes of Paul Nichols and Did you? yeah, and I suppose you know Q Card and Quarto Star. I you know I was probably thinking, Christ, I'd like to lead it up, let alone ride ride it, you know. Um, but um, yeah, it's it was um, it was I suppose it was unbelievable how I sort of progressed so fast and. Um, you know, I think I rode my first grade one winner when I was a five pound claimer or something. So, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was lucky to be in the position I was in. When you, when you came on the scene though, like obviously everyone knew that you had such a successful pointing background in a quick time, pony racing, you'd done well, links to Ron, to his, you know, the honey balls. Did you feel like you were the new, sort of new kid on the block in a way? And was it, were you conscious to try and not like, run before you can walk or be seen as sort of cocky or know it all and, and I'm not saying in yeah. anyone said that but it's probably quite hard not to when everyone's going oh have you heard about this Harry Cobden lad I think I think you know you obviously get put in your place quite easily in the way in room and um if I had my time again I would have prob probably done a, maybe an extra season's point to pointing just because I was too weak, probably not ready to ride against professionals. I think too many um, young lads turn too early. Um, Just purely from strength, from like from being strength, a boy, essentially. Like, it's like I'm 22 now. Um, when I was 16, I was definitely not strong enough to ride a proper racehorse, in my opinion. Um, like, I, like in in a, in a big race, you know, I think I rode a Greatwood Earl winner when I was 17, and. Um, Looking back now, I, I probably wasn't strong enough. Well, I don't think I was strong enough. But at the time, you would have been like, yeah, ready for it. Ready right. for it. You yeah. tell yourself you're ready for yeah, it. Yeah. But like, yeah, like even like going round, you're, you're struggling to hold them a little bit and you're not strong enough in the finish and stuff like that. I think if I waited an extra 12 months, I'd have been a lot stronger. And, um, you know, fitness is a huge thing as well. I know like lads are getting up early in the morning, then getting in the yard at like just after six o'clock and they're still there at 5.30 at night mucking horses out and doing them over and feeding and stuff like that but you know fitness is 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 something that's extremely underestimated and um you know the fitter you are the stronger you are the better you're going to be i read somewhere that um your mum wanted you to do gcse's yeah i think she thought you were doing gcse's but you had your mind set on being a jockey is that right you dropped out of school before gcse's yeah so on my um on my 16th birthday, I decided that I didn't want to go back to school because I wanted to pursue my career as a jockey. Now, part of me looking back thinks it was quite a silly idea because you never know what's around the corner when you're riding, do you? But um, I was, um, I remember on the day of my GCSEs, I was meant to be going to, I went to Leicester rather to ride my first hunter chase uh, for Anthony and Rachel Honeyball. And, um, 
it was like 33 to 1 chance I probably had no chance on paper but anyway it got up and won on the line and um, I think my dad had 20 quid on it or something <laughs> like that so um, it got us it, it made my mum a bit happier when he came home from the bookies <laughs> but you know it was just like it was it was an amazing day and um, definitely worth not going in and sitting down and doing the doing this English exam. Did you feel like in any way that you missed out on a sort of in inverted commas normal childhood because by the sounds of it you've been in riding boots since you were nine and grafting away for where you are now yeah but it's um you know i was i'm i do quite a bit on the farm with my dad and stuff like that and help out doing that sort of thing so it's not always been sort of horses 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 and um i suppose a, a part of your sort of life that you miss out on is sort of socialising isn't it because when you're 16 and 17 I never really went out at all and I was always riding on a Saturday or a, or a Sunday and stuff like that so I mean I, I never went out but I'd say my mum wouldn't have let me go on out anyway if I wanted to she was probably the driving force behind me to make sure I keep on the sort of straight and narrow if you like and um you know all your friends are going out and they're they're driving past to come and pick you up and you've got to let them drive on and go on out for the evening and but you're it must sat be home. hard right it was yeah it was, it's, it's hard when you're 16 17 because that's what you want to do and yeah. you know sort of girls come into your life don't they and uh there's there's plenty of distractions but um no I, my mum didn't let any of that happen and uh i suppose i should thank her for it now because i wouldn't be where i am were you quite a rebellious I mean, clearly you you were quite sort of headstrong and knew you didn't want to do GCSEs. But would you have been? Would you have given your mum and dad a bit of grief along well, the? Yeah, definitely. I, I gave my mum and dad plenty of stick, but my mum's quite a strong character, and um, you wouldn't want to cross her too often. <laughs> uh, and 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 how do you combine being potential champion jockey, Paul Nichol stable jockey, with being a twenty-two-year-old guy? Um, well, to be honest with you, at the moment, my sort of mindset's just fixed on, fixed on sort of making as much money as I can. And, you know, I'm trying to set up for the future, get a bit more land and I want to build a house and do certain other things. So I don't really have any distractions. The only thing I'm sort of thinking about is turning over money and trying to make as much as I can just because I want to get on my feet early and um, try and be successful. So um, yeah, sort of girls and stuff like that and going out and I, I sort of feel like I'm past that and I want to just you know sort sort myself out and get myself ready for um later in life when I'm not riding and do you because of that so you've obviously got a good business brain on you and the the, the pound notes that come with grade one winners etc obviously are important as well as the, the prestige of winning those races but are you very conscious then that this might be a relatively short career and you want to maximise it both riding but also set yourself up for the future in other areas? Yeah, so um, I've got a few other little things going on and, you know, I, you, with like riding, you never know when your time's up to. So I think when I was, what was I, just 19 I thought, or, or 18, I, um, I had a fall at market race and then fractured my neck in two places and it was quite a nasty incident and I was in a neck brace for uh, 14 weeks or something like that so you know that quickly opens your eyes up and um, it could have been one of those incidents where you're not going to ride again so um, you know I just want to be financially stable uh, just in case something does happen because you you never know if you go out and party and blow everything up the wall then it's, yeah. there's 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 um you know there's nothing left is there if something did happen so i just you know i'm trying to get you know set up and ready sounds like you got a very good head on on young shoulders um i actually saw george russell you know the formula one driver right young lad and he was interviewed and they did like a sort of funny interview and they said, have you ever used the line that you're a Formula One driver to try and impress a lady? And the guy he was with said, oh, no, I'd never do that. And George Russell goes, oh, yeah, no, I've done that. <laughs> have you ever used in Somerset that you're Paul Nichols, his stable jockey? No, <laughs> no, I've never said that. Never, ever said that. Just some farmer, some farmer. <laughs> Um, and the farm is obviously something that's really important and that's another avenue that you buy land, you've got a shoot that I think you've yeah. set up and stuff. So that's another revenue stream, yeah. I guess, for you. Yeah. How's that all going? Yeah, really well. We, um, obviously, lockdown didn't help it because we were shut down for a month, but um, it, it works well now. I've got two good lads on full time doing it. My brother helps a bit as well. And um, 
just hopefully try and earn a few quid with that. And um, so, when you're not riding in your car on the way back from races, are you ringing them up? How's the land going? You know, are you like yeah, const- just, constantly you know, on the go? How do we how do we get on today? Everyone happy? You know, it's it's um it's quite a, quite a lot to sort of process in your brain because you know we try and shoot three days a week and um, you, you've got different people coming. They want different things. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's it's almost a full time job in itself. But you know, I've got my brother and my sort of two gamekeepers doing it for me, and um, I don't have to be there. I've just got to organise it also, make sure it's all right, and as long as they know what they're doing, then. It's, um, it works well. And do the people that come down for the shoot ever ask for tips? Do they know that you're Harry Cobden the jockey by day and Tell shoot on, organiser by night? Racing and shooting works quite well because it's sort of the same sort of people. So um, a lot of people that bought days oh. um, shooting are sort of racing people as well. So that's um, magic. Yeah, that's no, great. You mentioned that injury that you had when you were young. How, how do you... This is the part of being a jockey that I'll never understand because we as sort of ordinary folk are just not wired the same. Like if I had, when I was 19 or 18, that injury, I'd never want to jump a fence again because that's how I'm wired and you're wired very differently. So how do you cope with that, the bottle side of things and maintaining your bottle because you've got to be brave, but also the mental side of things as a young man who's, you know, struck in their bed for 14 weeks, essentially. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you, you've, it was just one of those freak things that happened. It wasn't even a, like, a heavy fall, you know, you see bad falls and jockeys jump up absolutely fine. Um, it was just a sort of a soft fall, I fell off the side, banged my head on the ground, it was quick ground and damaged my neck. So, um, I suppose, how'd you get over it? You, you, you I, I, um, Obviously went to Oaksy House and had a lot of treatment up there. And the first couple of times I came back riding, I felt pretty ropey because I had such a long time off. But um, I suppose from a from a mental point of view, um, I was always all right. I never thought, is this thing gonna? Yeah. Am I gonna fall off and do my neck again? I ne- or break my neck again? I never, never ever thought. I, I think, I think if you go out there and ride negatively, that's when you get hurt. So um, you know when you change your mind or make a second decision that you probably shouldn't be doing too close to a fence that's when the horse makes a mistake so um yeah i was i suppose i was fortunate in a way that it never troubled me are you still treated in the weighing room as a as a a young man do you know what i mean like you see a lot of the elder statesmen of the weighing room they've got their peg and they know that's you know scoo's peg or whatever and obviously 10 15 years ago it's probably a bit different but do you feel very established in that way I mean, when you walk in and you're sort of seeing these names and faces etc are you looking around and do you still feel like a young man uh, no I feel quite comfortable in there really um, uh, like my valet's Phil Taylor and I remember when I started riding six years ago there was you know loads of good jockeys in there riding like Ruby Barry Wayne Hutchinson Andrew Thornton um, you know, there was a lot of jockeys uh, that were sat further up the ladder than me on my sort of side that are pretty much all retired now. So um, there's actually not many of us left in 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 my side. There's nowadays it's like me, Sean Byrne, Adam Wedge. There's a sort of a younger generation there. The the older generation have all retired in like the last five years. And um, yeah, no, it's it's comfortable. We get on. Everyone gets on well, and it's it's a good atmosphere. But it must be. Don't want to put words in your mouth, but when you're a 17, 18, 19 year old, say a grade one, right? Your first grade one, you're a claimer, you ride, you ride in the in your grade one, then you end up winning it. There's no quarter given in, in any race, we know that, but particularly in grade ones, and you're trying to get in or go up the inner of Ruby or whoever it is, you've got to have balls to do that. You've got to have real cojones to 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 go, actually, no, I am the new kid on the block. So so how do you get the balance right between being that kid, but also being the guy that wants to learn and absorb as much information from them. Yeah, I suppose it's hard, isn't it? I, I, I remember I was riding at Cheltenham one day, I couldn't tell you what race it was, and there was like Russell and Barry and Ruby in there, and um, I think I might have been lined up a couple, with fourth or fifth, and where everyone's got the position, and then Ruby gets down to start last, turns a circle, walks in, drops in front, and like, you just sat there thinking, no, I won't say anything. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it's it's um, it's changed a lot since then. You know, it's, yeah, I I wouldn't have any issues with anyone. And um, I, I suppose when you're 16 or 17, it's quite hard to process because you wouldn't want to say anything to 
I suppose you're not nearly your idols, I suppose, like Ruby and Barry, they're people that you watch when you're growing up and um yeah, it's um I was it was a uh, it was it was it was daunting enough when you had them leaning on you, sort of turning in and stuff like that. Anyway, who who were your idols growing up? Was it Ruby and Barry? Yeah, Ruby, Barry, AP, Russell, all the, the sort of greats, you know. And um, it was I, I remember it was it was weird, sort of um, walking into the weighing room for the first time and sitting near them, I suppose. And then like one of them talks to you, and you're like, oh. <laughs> all right it's, 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 it's just quite a, it's, i suppose it's quite a daunting thing because you um respect them so much would would they have given you advice through your career um i suppose if you if, if, if you asked him but like ruby wouldn't really say too much to be honest um doesn't show up now on the telly <laughs> <laughs> like, like ruby wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't say much much to you and um i i, I suppose um when when barry got the jp job and and, and he was over here quite a lot and i was riding for just started going for Paul. I got on really well with him, and um, you know he was very helpful. If you wanted to know anything, you know Barry would be your man to go to, and you know he was probably, in my opinion, the coolest man in racing. Um, you know, something would get beat. He's given it a great ride. It's got beat. It was probably odds on favourite. He'd come in smiling because he knows he's done his best, and there's another day. And you know I think that's the way you got to be. A lot of lads take defeat quite badly, but you know he was. Um, yeah, he was brilliant. Are there sort of hats flying across the room and whips going when there's? Jockeys coming in, or has that changed yeah, a bit? Those, I'd say those days are gone. You obviously hear the old stories about when there was little kerfuffles and stuff like that, but no, that that wouldn't happen anymore. Really? Um, you know, it's quite professional now, and um, I just it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Did you base your style on anyone? Um, I suppose I tried to look like Ruby, but I couldn't really look like him, so I just sort of look like myself after that and I don't I don't I don't know if I I don't, I don't think I really look like anyone just sort of works for you yeah looks good is the strength the main area that you've improved over the years would oh, you say definitely and I think in the last six months I've improved um and hopefully I will keep improving because you know I, I'm only 22 now I, I've Going into the start of this season, I've never been fitter riding. I've worked on my fitness a fair bit and my core strength, and um, I thought that was a massive help. Like sometimes, like maybe the season before, it takes you sort of three weeks to get back going properly because it's physically quite demanding, isn't it? So is that with like a personal trainer that you have, like yeah. away from that? So I went and saw this chap and I still see him a bit now and he's actually just putting in a hydro pool so I can go around at night and we can do a bit of swimming and Wait, stuff like that. Jacuzzi sessions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think it would be, I think it would be good just to sort of, you know, hydro pool's pretty good, don't they? Loosen off and yeah. stuff like that. So, so do you think that's um, an improvement in the professionalism of jockeys, both in their fitness, their work away from the track, like you said, you you have the personal trainer, but also nutrition, diet. Are you like conscious of all that? To be not? honest, on the on the diet side of things, I sort of just eat what the rest of my family eat, and like it's all relatively healthy stuff. We wouldn't have like McDonald's and stuff like that. My mum would be cooking, so it'd be just like good honest food, really. Yeah. So yeah, but you've just got to look after that side yeah, of things. Yeah. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't go back for thirds or anything like that. <laughs> Probably not allowed. Um, when you look at the Christmas period coming up and you mentioned that when you were a kid you were looking at Corto, Ruby, all these people. Now when you drive into to pools, you go into ditch it and on the left is the board, I think where Corto and Denman were and they've got all their sort of King George plaques and all that. It's such an iconic race. You're now the number one there and obviously last year it didn't go to plan. This year you'll be wanting surname's name on a plaque in the King George. Um, do you think he can do it? Um, I think he could. Obviously, you know, Clan de Zobo's probably the one to beat, and he's gone there and won the last two races, and I've got off him again. Um, Did you have the choice this year? Well, I rode Surname first time out, and I sort of... I think if Surname turns up at his absolute best, he's probably the best horse in the country, I think. so. Um, Is he the best you've ridden? I think so. Like no horse would give you a feel like him. He can do stuff that other horses can't. He can stand off and he still gets out the other side as far as he stands off. He's just an unbelievable horse. But um, I, I'm I'm sure if the real surname turns up, he'll take a lot of beating. Um, 
Whereas obviously it's Clan de Zobo's track, it's Clan de Zobo's race, isn't it? So um, the way I, I think the way I look at it, which one would I be more annoyed of getting off? I'd be more annoyed if I got off surname to ride Clan de Zobo and surname beat me. So, um, you know, if, if Clan de Zobo wins, great. Jed Mason's my sponsor. He's been phenomenal to me and I'd be absolutely delighted for him. But um, if his surname beat me, I'd, uh, I'd be pretty gutted. Did you beat yourself up about it last year? Um, Was that a tough... Christmas period for you to take it all in? No, uh, I I sort of, I think I took it quite well, really. I was probably annoyed for about five minutes and then moved quickly on to the next day. Really? Yeah. Again, is that stuff that you sort of learned from, like, Barry when you were growing up? Just that attitude of, like, right, put it behind you and crack on? Um, Cause you're... Yeah, I don't know. I like, And then, obviously, uh, it was a sort of... Same thing at Cheltenham this year, wasn't it? When Altior and Chacon Possois didn't run in the um, champion chase, yeah. and then Politlog yeah. won the champion chase, and and then I suppose even going to Sandown last Saturday, I rode Grenatine and Politlog won the Tingle Creek. So um, it's just sort of like stuff that you have gotta take well, isn't it? And um, it's part of the job. It's kind of a luxury to have those choices. I yeah, think. I mean, I, I didn't really have much choice on Saturday, but. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you've just got to not worry yourself about and move on to the next one. Did you, and have you, watched back the King George a lot and gone, I know how I'm going to beat Clan de Zobo this time around? I've certainly watched it back plenty. Um, I wouldn't have beat Clan de Zobo last year, whatever happened, because I don't think the surname was on his A-game going there. Um, some may agree or disagree, but he definitely wasn't the horse that turned up at Ascot. Um, so, you know, this year we're going into it hopefully with a different horse, a fresher horse, a better horse. And um, I think I, I, I won't be, um, I won't be forcing him early. I won't be sort of throwing him down to fences early. Um, and I'll be trying to conserve as much energy as I can because I know Clander Zobo is going to be hot on his tail <laughs> turning in. Can you just give an insight into what he feels like when you ride him compared to other horses? You mentioned that the feels and yeah, the like best. he's got a, he's got a massive stride on him, and he's got a hell of an action, and um, like he just goes down to a fence, and you can almost—I know you shouldn't say this, but you can—I I trust him. Um, you know, if you lent into him, you, you you know, if you if you're positive, he's going to come for you, and like if you just sit against him, he's going to chip away. So. Um, he's, he's a horse that I really enjoy riding. And really trust, which is obviously yeah. massive, yeah. Would it mean an awful lot to you, obviously it would, sorry, it would mean an awful lot, I'm sure, to win a King George, but given what happened 12 months ago, given the doubt, I suppose, around surname going into Weatherby, will he be as good going that way? And for, for him, and to a certain extent you, to sort of stick two fingers up to the doubters, if there are any, must, would, I'm sure, give you immense satisfaction. Yeah, it'd be great, it'd be great. It'd be something that I quite like to do, but um, <laughs> look, it's, uh, it, I just hope the horse goes in top form and he produces his best, and if we get beat on the day, we do. So what's Christmas Day entail for you then? Is it just... Nice big Christmas dinner, probably enjoy it, do a bit of work in the morning and um, get ready for Boxing Day. Can you have a big Christmas lunch? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of weight on all of them on, uh, <laughs> on the 26th, so I won't have to worry about too much. And um, is Boxing Day a big time of year for shoots and things like that? Uh, no, we're actually having eight days off over Christmas, so... You can focus yeah, on the riding. Yeah, give, give, give the lads a break and give me mum a break <laughs> and, uh, yeah, concentrate on the racing. But it's not just the King George, there's other great races, the Welsh National if you're at Chelsea, yeah. Chepstow, or terrific races at Kempton, Challow Hurdles around that time of year as well. So is that a time of year that almost whilst the rest of the world are celebrating Christmas, you're just... Yeah, we've got to be on the A game. Yeah. Um, it's a massive, massive, massive part of the season and um, I'm sure Paul's got lots of horses that he's going to run over the Christmas period and then we'll go a little bit quiet in January. So, um, yeah, we we um, we need to get it right. How is it riding for, for Paul? Uh, challenging at times. In what way? Um, in what way? He... he um, he doesn't always see a jockey's point of view sometimes, but then he has time to rethink on it and and then thinks twice about it. But um, you know he he he's obviously he's obviously hard to ride for. He's had lots of jockeys in the in the past, but you know we we've got a good relationship and um, 
I get on very well with him. You know, obviously you can't win every race, but he sends every horse to the races thinking that he can win. So, um, you know, he's extremely, extremely competitive. The most competitive man I've ever come across. Yeah. He wants to win everything. And, um, you know, that's, I th- I'd say that's probably why he's the best trainer. You know, he's, he, he's, he's, well, he's a 10 time champion trainer. He's no fluke, is he? Do you think he's very good friends with Sir Alex, who obviously is involved in, in clan and others? Do you think he is the Sir Alex Ferguson of racing, that competitiveness? Like, I've never seen it before. And when he's at the races and he's, you know, he's got the binoculars on and he's, he wants to win, no matter whether it's 33 to 1 or 2 to 5, do you think that that, that competitiveness does, is actually what makes him as good as he is? I think so. And he's so driven, you know, he never sort of... Um he never sort of relaxes and stops thinking thinking about horses. He's like, I, I swear to God, he like goes to sleep thinking about horses and what he's going to run where and what he's going to enter and how's this horse going and does that want a certain trip? And actually, the, the, it was quite funny. The other day I was riding at Wincanton and it was the first time I've actually sort of, when, you, when you're riding, you don't really hear the crowd. But because there's, uh, there's no one at the races at the moment, um, I was riding at Wincanton and I could hear him shouting as I was jumping the last. And I, I don't, I don't know. I just started like smiling and trying to like really. Were you hard. in front? I, take I was it. in front. Yeah, yeah. and and it, it won. But I could hear him as I was jumping the last, and I just found it quite funny. But um, you know, it's the first time I've ever heard someone at the races. If you know what I mean, like normally you don't really sort of you sort of block the crowd out a little bit. And um, but yeah, I could just hear Paul Nichols shouting at me down at the last. <laughs> That's mad. I don't think it's quite hair dry treatment, but I know from speaking to other jockeys who have been in that role in the past that that competitiveness is like another level, probably to anything they've experienced in racing. And as we've discussed, it is what makes him multiple, multiple champion trainer. But as a young, again, as a young man who's finding their feet, it, forget being a jockey for a second. In any industry, if your boss was quite a hard taskmaster who wants the best results all the time, it must be quite hard to sort of go, right, this is the real world, this is how it's done, and f- find an equilibrium where you and him can both work together. Did it take you a bit of time to sort of click in? Yeah, I suppose, but because I started there so young, I suppose Paul, the way Paul Nichols works is the only thing I've ever known. So I suppose, it, you know, he, he's, he's obviously a, a, like, a hard man and he wants everything done right, but like at the end of the day, I don't care what he's like, unless and as long as I'm on the best horses and he's sent them there in top in in top form and you know he, he might let you have it when you've done wrong, but at the end of the day, you've done wrong, so you probably deserve it. On other occasions when you don't deserve it, and uh, as long as I go in thinking right, I've done my best today, then on to the next day, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I certainly wouldn't go home thinking um, my my boss had a go at me today. Yeah, you wouldn't be going, Mum. No, no. <laughs> Paul was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure she'd take that too well either, no. would she? Um, are you able to have like a laugh and a drink and a beer with him when things go well? And yeah, like, is, like, is, like, obviously, like when when things are going well, it's 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 brilliant. When things aren't going so well, he's mm. fine, but um, he just wants to win and wants to put it right. And you know, if if if, if the jockey's not doing the right thing, then he's gonna let you know about it. And I remember about five or six years ago, um, sort of when Corto Denman left the yard, he was very, like, he goes, right, we're sort of clearing the decks a bit and we're starting again, building from the bottom up. And now he's reaping the rewards of that because there's, you know, he's obviously got his old timers like Politolog and Clan that keep performing, but there seems like a really exciting young group of horses coming through at Ditch It. Yeah, and like, um, Sean Byrne actually came in the other day and scored a few and he said, um, in the sort of five years that he's been riding out at Ditch It, he said, He's never sat on a nicer bunch of young horses, so um, and he'd be a good judge. And you know they're buying nice animals, good types, and um, you know, they're costing a few quid, but you can you can you can you can really see there there's some real quality there going going out every day. Who are your who are your mates in the weighing room? Who would you get on best um, with? I suppose like the, the few I sit next to, and you know Sean Bowen and Harry Bannister, and to be honest, I get on with everyone. I wouldn't have a, a, a best friend if you like. And how do you unwind? Because you're clearly a very busy man. I probably just get my mind onto something else. Yeah, like not 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 what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I was not thinking that. Um, yeah, like, yeah, just sort of you know concentrate on um, you know what else I'm gonna do. Yeah. So you, 
We mentioned that he's got some exciting horses and uh, you'll be on a few of them. Let's go through a few of them now. One horse that I think is, to the eye, incredibly impressive is Brave Man's Game. How, how does he feel? Yeah, he's, um, I'd say since I've been at Ditcher, he's the best novice hurdler I've ever sat on. Wow. Um, you know, he, he, was, he was a funny sort of horse when he came over. He's very, very sensitive. Um, on the first day of a round and a bumper was at Ascot, I could barely ride him down to the start and he was wired and he was keen for both of his bumper runs. Just really immature. Yeah, and sort of he stayed in training um, and then obviously went out to grass, came back in this year, got beat on quick ground around Chepso, but like he was far too green and it was just like a dash down over the last and he was done for toe, beaten by John Joe's soaring glory. And then um, he went on to um, Exeter, was very straightforward, wasn't keen, did everything really nicely and beat a 120 horse by 14 lengths. Uh, and then obviously he went to um, went to Newbury last time out and sort of he was he's almost half asleep when he went around there. And I like going down the back the last time and I was not I wasn't I was sort of just relaxed on him and he was bobbing bobbing away and I didn't really know what sort of fuel I had left in the tank, so I got upsized Nico jumping last down the back and he latched onto the bridle, so and I settled him back in again and yeah, and turned in and he sort of just grabbed hold of the bit, turned in and taken off like an absolute steam train. So um, he's all class and he's a lovely, awesome one I'm really looking forward to. Is he an out and out stayer in your eyes? Um, I'm not really sure. I, I I think they might target probably the Ballymore at the festival this year. I, you know, Albert Bartlett's Tough three race, miles isn't it, and it yeah. might just cook him a little bit. Whereas um, he's got enough pace to travel in a, in a Ballymore, and he's not he's not actually a slow horse. Always a always although he's like a big brute of a horse, he's not slow. So um, you know, I th I'd say they run him in that. But obviously, it's going to be very competitive, isn't it? But um, I think he does definitely deserves to line up. And what about next destination over the larger obstacles? How exciting a novice chaser is he? Yeah, obviously Newbury's not the easiest place to jump around. Obviously it's a lovely track, but nice fences, aren't they? And um, he jumped great. It was probably a pretty perfect sort of chasing debut, wasn't it? Um, do you think he can be competitive at the festival if he goes? Yeah, I think Paul will probably run him in an RSA. Yeah. Um, we've won the race before. Um, but yeah, look, he's... He's obviously had problems in the past. He had a long time off, didn't he? And he's come back. He had a nice hurdle run at Weatherby, and then obviously he, he's he's won well at Newbury, and he's um I think he'll probably be targeted at the RSL or something like that later on in the season. Uh, this year, Sporting Life is sponsoring the Arkle. Um, what's it like riding two miles in those races at Cheltenham? Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, it's pretty rapid. You're on quick horses and you've got a decent gallop, don't you? And um, I suppose we've got sort of two horses that could run in the race this year, Quell Destin and uh, Hitman. Hitman was just narrowly beaten at um, Sandown on the weekend. He was beaten two lengths by um, All Mankind. He'll probably go our favourite for the race. Uh, well, if Shishkin doesn't turn up. Yeah, <laughs> if Shishkin doesn't turn up. But when you've got horses like All Mankind, you've got a horse like All Mankind who goes like, you know, flat out, flat out from the start. You've got Shishkin who can clearly travel well and go in, into, a, into a race well, we think. Um, for a jockey, is that, I mean, I spoke to Joe about it, who won the race in 99 on flagship Uber Alis, but is that when the blood really starts to pump and the heart rate goes up a little bit more? Yeah, look, look it's, it's pretty furious over the first few and you're going to right gallop and you're on novices that haven't had loads of experience so you've got to almost help them a little bit and um, yeah it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great buzz. And you, you know what you were saying about not hearing the crowd? At Cheltenham in the Skybet Supreme you know everyone goes on about the roar yeah. do you not hear that? I can hear that yeah <laughs> that is pretty loud though. That must be is that when like for us as racing fans, that noise is just like exceptional. We go, right, it's Cheltenham. For you as jockeys, you're like, right, let's go. Like, it's, it's quite hard to explain, but like, um, for example, say if your leg's hurting, and even if you're riding around Plumpton on a Monday, the adrenaline going through your body as you're going around, you don't feel your leg. So, um, like, if you're riding there, the adrenaline pumping through your body, and then added by the crowd's noise and everything going round, you're, 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 you're pretty pumped up. I've never taken drugs, but I'm sure it probably is, like, the closest thing to it. That's class. Does Cheltenham, does riding winners at Cheltenham, will that define your season, do you think? Um, 
like riding winners at Cheltenham is what everyone wants to do, and I've been fortunate enough to have a couple there. But um, yeah, it's uh, Cheltenham's not the be all and end all in my book because there's plenty of other good races to win. But do you think too much focus is put on Cheltenham? Um, possibly. Um, a lot of trainers just target Cheltenham, don't they? Whereas, sort of, Paul Nichols, on the other hand, would. Um, target Saturdays throughout the whole season and you know if we're good enough at Cheltenham we're good enough but we don't have anything that to run in the handicaps that are well in if you like we don't really set them up because we try and win our races all through the season um so um you know in in the in the graded races um we we've we've got you know if we're if we're competitive and we got a good enough horse and we've got a great chance but um yeah I think a, fit, a lot of trainers do just target Cheltenham don't they mm. And there's a lot of talk about it at the moment as well, and um, the focus being on Cheltenham. Um, but that's a good point about Paul, actually, because he does. He, he just wants to win through the year, yeah, and sort of then just, Cheltenham comes just around. Wants and, yeah. Yeah, if he's got something that can be competitive next Saturday, it's running. Given what I think I've learned more so than ever when I've spoken to you about today being not just a very good jockey, but having quite a good business head on you, do you, do you see this as a relatively short career? I mean, John Franken retired very young. You know, some very good jockeys have retired young. Or do you, do you want to be riding horses? Can you see an end in sight? I know that's such a weird question because you're so young, but... Um, Christ, I'm only 22, Ollie. We're talking about retirement. <laughs> no, 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 I know, but I you know what I mean? I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Because like, you've obviously got other interests and you obviously want to make money elsewhere and yeah. things like that. Like, um, sometimes there is more to life than just racing, isn't there? There is a world outside of racing, and when you're yeah. a jockey and or whatever, all your sort of mind is thinking about is racing, isn't it? Um, so I, I don't plan on going until I'm forty, if that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. But um, I'm gonna try and make as much money as I can until I, I, you know, I'm forced to stop. I want to stop. And is money the factor? Um, Money definitely helps, it? <laughs> but like it's obviously great to ride winners. It's amazing buzz riding good horses, and um, you know I feel fortunate to to be where I am. But the money certainly helps because it sort of gets everything else that you want in life. Do jockeys make a lot of money? Probably not as much as ITV. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, Harry. You're, I think you're on the right side of the fence. Um, is there a race that you particularly want to win? Gold Cup. That's the one. Yeah. Um, Why is that? Because it was the race growing up. That... Yeah, it's one race that I'd love to win. Um, I think Cerning might go for it this season. Really? Yeah. I'm I'm confident he's going to run in it. Um, Has that Nichols. been talked about by the, the team? I don't know if it's being talked about, but I'm fairly certain he'll run in it. Paul Nichols knows what it takes to train a Gold Cup winner. Um, will he stay 3 2? I think he will. Really? Yeah. Um, I think he will. And. Um, Look, we'll have to see. The thing is, if you like bounced him out and blitzed him for three mile two, then he wouldn't stay, would he? But like, if you sort of not taking your time, but you could ride him to get the trip, and he's actually quite a, quite a fast horse as well. So if you had a bit left in the in the tank up the hill, he'd be boring up there. So surname could be the one that gives gives you the race you most want to win. Um, yeah. Grand um, National, where would that rank for you? Fair bit lower down. Really? Yeah rather win a King George and a Grand National. Obviously a Grand National is a race that everyone wants to win, isn't it? But like, I think it's amazing. You need so much luck to get around there because horses fall in front of you. And obviously the Grand National isn't what it was, is it? When the fences were massive. Yeah, terrifying. The old jockey say, you want to ride in it when I used to ride around in it. But um, like, it's, um, it's a race you need loads of luck on it. Like, for like Davy won two nationals, didn't he? Year after year, and like that was unbelievable because he steered old Tiger all right. I know he's been round there, but like he steered him round. He's got in no trouble. He's and he and he's won two nationals. It's unbelievable, and um, it, you need loads of luck. Like, whereas like Gold Cup King George, they are like the best horses, aren't they? They're the best horses in the country, and they're they're running those races. So I guess my final question is. What would it mean to you then if come this time in 12 months I'm interviewing you again? Uh, that's not the question. But if I was interviewing you again and I say to you, King George Gold Cup winning jockey Harry Cobden, how, how special would that be to hear that? If you added champion jockey on that as well, that would be, that'd be lovely. And do you, do you realistically think that all three of those things can be achieved this year? Um, 
they could be achieved, definitely. Whether it will happen, I don't know. You obviously need a lot of luck, don't you? You need fast horses to win the Jockeys' Championship. You need the best horse in the country to win the King George and the, and, and the Gold Cup. So um, there are definitely possibilities and it could definitely happen. Good luck with it all. Thanks very much.